It was in the air we breathed, literally. It was in the soil that kids played in. It was on the walls that children lived in. This is lead. Abundant, pliable, and durable, it fueled the growth of American cities. At the end of the 19th, early 20th century, lead was introduced into virtually every home in the country and every waterway in the country and every construction site in the country. It was widely used in paints to create certain tints, speed drying, and increase durability. Lead's malleability and durability made it a popular choice to build and join water lines and plumbing. And it was added to gasoline in the 1920s to prevent engine knock and boost performance. It was everywhere, and we're now paying the price for literally a century of pollution. In other words, modern America was built with lead. And even after we found out it was toxic, it's still all around us. We now know that exposure to lead at an early age can cause a lifetime of problems. And even minute concentrations of lead, as little as a sugar packet spread across a football field, can cause harm. In fact, the CDC says there's no amount of lead in a child's blood that's considered safe. The agency estimates that half a million children today have enough lead in their blood to warrant public health action. A recent study found that more than half of all American kids had lower but still potentially harmful amounts of lead in their blood. And black children are more than twice as likely than white children to have high levels of lead in their blood. For much of the 20th century, the public didn't pay attention to just how toxic lead was. And as the medical community warned policymakers, the lead industry fought back. Huge companies that were dependent on this material for their profits began to start giant propaganda campaigns selling lead as a healthful material, literally saying this this guards your health. Lead as something that makes children happy that will make you modern in your new modern home. In fact, the industry said it was a gift of God. A public awakening to the problem only came in the 1960s and 70s, thanks in part to community activism. The Young Lords and the Black Panthers conducted door-to-door lead poisoning screenings, ran health clinics offering testing, and even staged sit-ins at local health departments. Groups who were concerned about poverty and inequality in America began to identify lead poisoning as a socioeconomic indicator of inequality. And by the 70s, pioneering research showed that even exposure to low levels of lead was harmful. It was children who were exposed to low-level lead who were failing in school or having behavioral problems. Starting in the 70s, the federal government limited and eventually banned lead's use in paint, plumbing, and gasoline. And the amount of lead in blood for the average American child plummeted. But this isn't the end of the problem. More lead-contaminated soil than federal officials once thought. Lead paint in old homes. The contamination coming from old lead pipes. Lead is still all around us. Millions of older homes are still covered in lead paint. And when that paint chips or creates dust, it can pose a threat to children. Lead-contaminated soil can pose a risk to kids as well, especially near industrial facilities or busy roadways where lead was once heavily used. And it can also contaminate drinking water when pipes and plumbing fixtures containing lead corrode. This legacy lead lingers in the environment unless actively removed. And in marginalized communities, the U.S. has failed to pay for the removal of lead. When lead poisoned black and brown children in the 1950s, the industry didn't acknowledge its product was killing kids. Instead, the Lead Industries Association blamed slums and black and brown parents for lead poisoning. Just heartrending documents where you see the industry saying, hey, it's black and Puerto Rican kids who are dying. What are we going to do about them? It's too expensive to clean it up. Basically, let's forget it for another generation. We can see those effects today. Take Chicago. These are the neighborhoods with a majority Black population. And this shows the percentage of kids with high levels of lead in their blood. Compare these maps and it's clear that predominantly Black neighborhoods tend to see more lead poisoning. And it's not just Chicago. Nationwide, Black children living in poverty are significantly more likely to have high levels of lead in their blood compared to their white or Hispanic peers. 
Public health experts agree that the most effective approach to protect children from lead is to remove it from the environment before a child can be exposed. It's expensive, but studies show prevention saves money in the long run. In some places, legal action has forced lead companies to pay for the cleanup. Starting in the early 2000s, California cities and counties sued former lead-based paint companies, claiming they caused a public nuisance. The party settled for $305 million, which is being used to remove lead from the community. It's not going to pay for everything, but it's the beginnings of a process. And I, I certainly believe that just morally, legally, humanely, it's really something we have to hold the companies accountable for. But for the last century, America has largely taken a wait-and-see approach to lead. In other words, we've waited for children to develop lead poisoning before investigating and remediating its source. And we're still doing that. We are now, even today, to the large extent, using the kids themselves as the guinea pigs, as the canaries in the mine, so to speak. You know, that's exactly the reverse of what public health should be.